name is Anna Neufeld, and I think most of you have met me to date. I'm the new Neuro-Ophthalmology Fellow, not so new anymore, I guess, but still new to some. So I'm going to talk about frontal lobe uh, uh, pathology and what it does to the eyeballs. So I'm going to start with a brief case presentation, and then we'll review the relevant anatomy and some literature, and then I'll conclude with three important takeaway points that I think everyone should remember from, from my brief presentation today. So this is a woman we saw in August this year. She is a 66-year-old um, and was referred to neuro-ophthalmology because of suspected non arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy. And um, she describes it as a kind of gradual onset vision loss over six months. Uh, or so, and um, she denies having any other symptoms like GCA symptoms or headaches or constitutional symptoms. Uh, relevant history includes the fact that she did have cancer, uterine cancer in 2012, which was treated successfully, and she also has this very severe depression, and she even required hospitalization for it uh, two months prior to seeing us, and she was admitted for two weeks because of it. These are her medications. So she's on an exanolytic medication and an antidepressant for her depression. And these are her examination findings. So first of all, when, when we entered the room, um, she looked very apathetic, very uninterested in the testing, kind of falling asleep during the testing. Um, so she had a friend there with her who was helping her kind of through this and through the exam. So keeping that in mind, you know, the, the exam and the visual field testing was somewhat unreliable, but we were able to get her to 2200 on the right. But this was very kind of eccentric viewing, kind of forcing her to, to get to that line. And then on the left, she was about 20 over 40. Her pressures were normal, um, but she did have a large relative afferent pupillary defect on the right and a color vision deficiency on the right, which was consistent <clears throat> with optic neuropathy. She had bilateral ptosis with MRD1 of about one millimeter, and um, on anterior segment, the only pathology was really some, some mild to moderate cataract changes. A dilated fundus examination showed temporal disc pallor on the right, um, and a disc at risk, and on the left, the nerve looked healthy, um, but also had the appearance of a tight optic nerve with a disc at risk. Her dilated exam and peripheral retina were normal. So these are her visual fields. Um, as I mentioned, they were somewhat unreliable. But what I want to draw your attention to is the fact that the right visual field has this global uh, depression. And on the left, there's a suggestion of a superior arcuate defect. And there is a visual field deficit kind of infrotemporally on that left eye. Because you don't really have the right eye to help you to guide whether this is a de indeed a neurological visual field or not, you kind of have to presume that it is either a bitemporal visual field deficit or a homonymous visual field deficit, which we can't really tell from the field. I don't have color photos, but these are the OCT uh, images. And it kind of gives you an, the impression that the discs are not cupped. They don't see much cupping there. And if we superimpose the retinal nerve fiber layer scan on top, this is the pattern of RNFL loss. And you can see that the, the majority of the loss is actually in the temporal area and maybe some inferior nasal. And on the left, it was normal. So what's next? You know, is this NION? Could we just assume that and maybe look for risk factors and just let her be? Well, I think there are some definite red flags in this patient, and specifically, she's a woman in her 60s. Um, she has this gradual onset rather than kind of a, a sudden realization of vision loss, a sudden um, loss of vision. She has a possible neurologic deficit with that inferior temporal deficit on the left. So we, you know, we were, of course, concerned about possible compression or neurologic pathology. So we proceeded with imaging. So I, I don't think I need to use my pointer here to point out the pathology, but um, you can see that in her frontal lobe, there's a large mass, 
these are the axial and coronal T1 MR images post GAD and fat suppression. And this mass measured about 7 by 7 by 5 centimeters in size. And um, not quite seen in this image, but it was compressing the right prechiasmic optic nerve and um, at the end of the, dis uh, the distal optic canal and some uh, mild compression of the optic chiasm. So immediately as we saw the scan, we sent this woman to the emergency room. There was a lot of uh, vasogenic edema around the lesion. So she was admitted and operated on. The pathology came back as meningioma WHO grade one. So let us talk briefly about frontal lobe anatomy and how that relates to the eye. First of all, um, visual pathways take up about a third of the overall brain volume. So I think ophthalmologists in general should and do have a good understanding of how uh, neurological lesions cause visual pathology. However, I think frontal lobe is often forgotten as a possible site of pathology for the visual system. So the frontal lobe contains about 30% of the cerebral volume of the brain. And as I mentioned, we kind of rarely think about it as a site uh, for lesions that cause visual pathology. So to briefly review the, the anatomy, um, here we have the, the Broca's area, which is present in the dominant hemisphere, which is responsible for speech. You have the prefrontal cortex, which is your personality and executive behaviors functional area. We have your uh, precentral gyrus, which is your primary motor cortex, and you have some supplementary motor areas which are responsible for motor planning. But most importantly, I think, and often, again, uh, forgotten, is this area here called the frontal eye fields that we'll, we'll discuss in, in a minute as well. So in terms of uh, general pathology in the frontal lobe, the most common benign and malignant is meningiomas, and they're 10 to 15% of all benign frontal lobe tumors. And on the malignant side, uh, those are gliomas, and they're 70% uh, of all malignant brain tumors in the frontal lobe. And I briefly wanted to mention some psychiatric presentations of the frontal lobe tumors, which are important to keep in mind. And I think you can look at it both ways. You can uh, look at all the patients that present with psychiatric illness and see how many of them have frontal uh, pathology uh, in terms of masses or otherwise. So if you look at all acute psychiatric presentations, the brain tumors are present in 0.3%, so not too common. That was um, published uh, quite, quite a few years ago, but even in the new publications, this is still in keeping with those numbers. If you look at all the hospitalized psychiatric patients, that number is about 1 in 200, which is pretty close to the original numbers. However, if you think about the normal population and the rate of incidental findings there, it's about 20% of that of the normal population. Now, if you flip it around and look at the patients who are known to have frontal lobe pathology and frontal lobe tumors, actually 60 to 90% of them have psychiatric illnesses. And to put that in perspective, if you look at all the patients with brain pathology, about 50% of them have psychiatric illnesses. Meningioma actually is the most common tumor that presents with psychiatric symptoms in patients. So the way to think about how frontal lobe neoplasms cause pathology in the visual system is you can kind of separate it into uh, non-localizing findings and localizing findings. We should all be familiar with the non-localizing findings, which is your increased intracranial pressure symptoms. So you know headaches, which is positional, transient visual, obs transient visual obscurations, diplopia, pulsatile tinnitus. But on findings, of course, we see papilledema associated with high ACP and unilateral bilateral six palsies, which are often called false localizing sign because they point you in the wrong direction in terms of localization of pathology. And in terms of localizing findings, um, systemically, they kind of relate to the, 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 the areas of the frontal lobe that I'd mentioned to you, which is the Broca's, which gives you expressive aphasia and prefrontal cortex, which gives you the deficits in concentration and judgment and behavior and psychiatric symptoms. And then, of course, the motor cortex, which gives you contralateral paresis. In terms of the ocular findings, which are relatively localizing, would be something like 
um, Foster Kennedy syndrome, which we'll talk about in just a minute. And the other thing um, that people do get in relationship to frontal uh, eye field lesions is either deviation of the eyes towards the site of the lesion, or they get acquired oculomotor apraxia. So I did, did want to spend a few moments talking about this because this is a really a favorite for exams and um, it, it is very clinically relevant. Um, it happens pretty rarely, I think probably in about one to two and a half percent of all of the um, frontal lobe lesions, but um, this particular syndrome was dis dis described by Dr. Uh, Robert Foster Kennedy, who was a neurologist in 1911, and he saw a patient who had a um, olfactory groove meningioma and presented with this particular finding. So there are two main findings in uh, Foster Kennedy syndrome. The first one is one optic nerve is atrophic, and that is due to the compression of that optic nerve by the frontal tumor. And the second finding is in the opposite eye, there's optic nerve head edema, which is noted, and that is related to the papal edema or to, the, uh, to increased intracranial pressure caused by the, by the tumor. So as you can see in this image here from a, a recent case report, it is the fact that this left eye has temporal pallor, which is your finding number one, and your left eye has this uh, edematous optic nerve, which is your finding number two. So this is Foster Kennedy syndrome. You cannot mention Foster Kennedy syndrome without mentioning pseudo Foster Kennedy syndrome, uh, which is a diagnosis of exclusion. And the reason why it is a diagnosis of ex exclusion is you really should include real Foster Kennedy syndrome if you are going to claim somebody has pseudo Foster Kennedy syndrome. And the most common etiology for that is sequential non arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy. Other things that are in this differential are listed, including arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy, optic neuritis, among, among others. On this image here, you can see again that the left eye has some temporal, temporal pallor and atrophy. And on the right, there is just the segmental optic nerve um, head swelling, which is in keeping with a non arteritic ischemic segmental optic neuropathy there. So um, I wanted to tell you about the outcome of this case, which is, was somewhat unfortunate because you thought you might be saving somebody's life by sending them to uh, the emergency room. But um, she uh, had a craniotomy and had her um, uh, tumor removed. However, um, a few kind of well, maybe a week or a week and a half later, 10 days later, she developed seizure-like activity and some cognitive deficits and she had an intracranial hemorrhage with a right MCA stroke. She had to return to the operating room for a frontal lobectomy and a craniectomy again with clipping of pseudoaneurysms and had a kind of complicated hospital course and is just currently being transferred to the um, rehabilitation unit. Some of the most recent psychiatric and uh, psychology notes say that she denies being depressed at this point, um, but um, her frontal lobe is, is gone, so um, she has some issues with mood and affect still, um, which is consistently flat, but um, when questioned, she does not feel depressed. So um, just to review the uh, three takeaway points, um, first of all, it's really important to think about the whole person, as Laura had mentioned, and if you see somebody's um, past medical history listing depression or personality changes and ask more about it, and uh, in addition to that, see unilateral optic atrophy, we would recommend imaging uh, those patients. You need to know what Foster Kennedy syndrome is, and that is one-sided optic atrophy and uh, contralateral um, disc edema. And the fact that the pseudo Foster Kennedy syndrome is uh, generally due to non arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy, uh, among other causes, lower in the differential. So I'd like to thank all the neuropathology team, and I will take any questions. So, um, Anna, the other point that I would make is that I don't think your patient ever had um, documented optic nerve swelling in that eye, mm -hmm. and that's another reason that to image her. To, right to not make a diagnosis of ischemic optic neuropathy. Absolutely.
know, are there specific signs, I mean, among psychiatrists, for instance, that would kind of push them towards imaging of patients? I imagine with that infrequent, um, mm -hmm. with it being that infrequent, they wouldn't, of course, routinely do it. Yeah. And in general, I think if you look at, you know, other issues like metabolic abnormalities respons responsible for psychiatric illness, it's, it's not a huge percentage, it's probably under 10% or so, but they still routinely do things like thyroid testing, etc. Um, I think things to look for acutely, you know, I'm not a psychiatrist, so I can't really claim, but um, I think is, is acute personality changes or acute changes in behavior, those are always important. If there's no risk factors associated with psychiatric illness, those, those are things to keep in mind as well. Great, thank you.